Welcome everyone. My name is um, Hank Heiser. I'm a senior lecturer in curriculum and learning design at QUT. Um, and I'm in the, the steering group for Televisor's uh, special interest group. Uh, we've got a, a very exciting um, session planned for this afternoon. It's a postgraduate showcase um, for PhD students, candidates, with a focus on, on advisors in the third space. Um, so, you know, the, the tensions between professional roles, academic roles, um, and all that that entails. Just a, a brief um, thing about Televisors itself. It's a, for those of you who haven't been here before. Um, it's a network, uh, it's a community of practitioners made up of people who work as educational technologists, learning designers, academic developers, and in a host of similar roles. So we all kind of work in, a, in what can be called the third space. Some of us are in academic roles, some of us are in professional roles, and that's pretty much what today's um, webinar is about. Um, I'll introduce uh, the, our next speaker is Karen Barak from, um, she's a learning and teaching consultant design at Griffith University. Um, the role works directly with academics, providing support and professional development in program and course design, um, emphasizing technology enabled design. Um, Karen has over 15 years of experience in learning and teaching, and she has a, a very keen interest um, in res researching academic and student approaches to technology rich environments. Karen, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm all good. Yeah, I got it to load. Um, thanks, thanks so much for today. Um, my presentation is a little bit different. I'm not actually speaking about our roles, but I'm more, my research is actually looking into um, how academics design and how we can help them, um, what areas they uh, design help we can, we can support them in. So it really kind of grew out of that, um, you know, that idea that we can have a design, but what students do with that design, we don't have there's always a mismatch. So what I'm really looking at is, you know, what academics conceive of their design, how they then actually build that design, and then how students interact with that design to see where the, um, the tensions are, and really to, to see how they design with technologies. Um, so it took, it's quite huge. It's so massive. Uh, uh, there was five different data points. So uh, it's a case study with five academics. I used uh, a TPAC survey to find those um, participants. And uh, so I chose two people who had an integrated TPAC. So they um, had high confidence in their knowledge and they um, used lots of technologies. And three cases were fragmented. So those who had low confidence, and uh, low use of technologies. And what I really wanted to do with this research is kind of bust this idea of the um, tech adoption being about early adopters, late adopters, or the laggards, um, which I've managed to prove uh, that it, and actually look at the design. So I had an interview with the academics and that where they talked about their design and how they built the course. I uh, analyzed their course profile and their look uh, LMS site to understand how they communicated the designs to the students and then I did a student focus group to um, get their perspective so I won't have enough time to talk about the student side because I really wanted to talk about the actual research tool that I built to do this um, so basically these are the components I want to see the interactions between the learning and teaching environment the technology enabled design factors context and how students and academics move through that uh, environment. Um, so to do that, I actually uh, built a code book and um, out of uh, contextual factors. So there's external contextual factors and there's internal. So those outside the uni and those inside the uni. For the technology enabled design factors, this is where I looked at TPAC and used TPAC. Um, I think it's a little bit limiting because it, um, it hides the participants in the context. It's really just talking about the academics' knowledge or what they think their knowledge is in these domains. 
Um, so that's, that's the design aspect. And then I used, um, for the learning and teaching environment to study that part, I'm using the community inquiry. So I actually preferred this one because this is kind of helps um, articulate what the learning and teaching environment is, how it's built um, and who, uh, the actions within that. So what the academic's doing, what the student's doing. But in this framework, it actually hides it just assumes technology is the facilitating factor. Um, so bringing those together in this code book, so basically there was 19 codes by putting these all together and I basically went through my interviews, through my course documentation and through the student focus group um, text and coded strictly for these 19 things. And what I could then do is both qualitative analysis um, and I could also use the quantitative analysis to do network diagrams. And I want to severely um, thank uh, my colleague David Jones who actually came up with the, um, provided the tech know-how to actually produce from MVivo the code the number of codes and then the connections between those codes into these network diagrams. Um, so what this will sh that can show you, and I'm not sure if this is a great this environment, but you can actually see the green is your TPAC, so this is their design knowledge and how it, they are using it. So Josh is a beautiful example of um, a very well integrated uh, design. You know, his TPAC is in relation to all the factors of the community inquiry. He's thinking about how he's going to teach it, how he's going to facilitate it, um, what social elements are needed, what cognitive elements, and you'll see the fabulous connections between the t all of them. And the thickness of the lines represents how these were co-located in his description. So when he was describe describing his TPAC design, he was actually saying it in relation to the learning and teaching environment he was trying to build. Now you'll see Donna on the on the right hand side was more fragmented. Now this is where the whole dichotomy around uh, early adopters, late adopters starts to fall down. You'll see she also talked about all of these things, but she couldn't talk to them as co connected ideas or as often in relation to each other. So she talked less about the social components, more about the facilitation and the cognitive um, kind of uh, connections, but there's much less connections between the two and lost, you'll see with the comments, like only one or two or three times in the hour interview, did she mention these things? So you start to see where their emphasis lies in their design. And you can also see that internal factors to the classroom, to the, the actual, um, the people in it really do affect these decisions. They have strong connections and strong influences. Um, so you see the interview, that was how they uh, described how they designed for the interview. But then when you look at the course profile, so this is the first point of call on how the students can understand the design, you can see that there is a lot less comments. And a lot, even Josh, um, there had his connections, they're not as strong. But those really, it's set more in the teaching, the instructional management, and this might be unique to our university, but um, across the five cases, there was absolutely very little difference between the way that they communicated their designs through the course outlines, which suggests that there's not a good tool for students to understand the design of the course. When you start to look at the um, course site, the LMS site, you can see that this might be a better space for um, academics to communicate their design. So this was looking at, you know, all the times that they put like um, instructional text in their site around objects in the announcements to see how they were describing and leading students through these designs. And you'll again see it's a lot of instructional management. Josh was a lot better at putting those instructional management in relation to the activities that he wanted them to uh, achieve, 
how they were achieving it with the technology to, to do those activities. Um, where you'll see Donna was a lot less successful around um, communicating her her hopes for the design um, for and how that how the technologies were being used to support that design. Um, what these uh, diagrams is I'm just going to skip over the students because um, what's what, where this is really applicable to us is that. With the design approaches, and I'm going to start with that second point, the real problem they have with technology-enabled design is the student in the student-centeredness. So they, they all spoke about student agency as their key pedagogical driver, but uh, only really two of them could actually talk about the students in the action of the design, so what the student did in the design, whereas the other three we could talk about the design, but not how the students, how they would facilitate the students through that design or support them. So I think that's really valuable to us. Um, that that really gives us a, a space to work with with academics is what bits about making those connections. It's not just uh, you know, it's not just lesson planning. You are designing a teaching environment, and how how do the people move through that environment? The other big key thing that came out of this research is that design for the academics is iterative, which I guess most of us know about that iterative process, but it was also very hierarchical. So the hierarchy being, you know, they have to, um, well, within a design, you have to design the learning objects, the learning activities and the facilitation, but contextual factors created a hierarchy because with the contextual factors workload, is huge. So the workload conditions um, as a, a context to a factor of influence. So it, design has become, um, I guess, and this is not new to everyone, it's become a pragmatic kind of approach. So they decide which part of the hierarchy in that, you know, when they're going from course to course delivery, which bit they're going to concentrate on. And this is where um, some of my cases in the design, they had LMT support. And they really were thankful that the LMT support could do the bits of the design that they couldn't, um, and or teach them the skills to to do the just parts of the design um, that they wanted to to achieve the whole design. Um, and the other big thing, and because I know I'm running out of time, is that university processes, and again, this might be unique to our the, the timetabling, the course light outline, production, the course design was all split in time and space. Like timetabling is six months, even to a year beforehand. So it's splitting this idea of a holistic learning and teaching environment into a potentially administration tasks. So um, they actually, we're not supporting them to actually think about it holistically. Um, I might. In there, if got lots more to say, but I realise that it's almost time. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Karen. Um, yes, um, I think we all have a lot more to say and ask, but we have we have run out of time. So I just wanted to um, thank all of the presenters: Yvonne, Natalia, Colin. And Karen, great way to finish, Karen. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a there's a space in uh, Teams in Televisors Teams to carry on much of the discussion that has started in the chat. So please um, contribute as much as you want and can. And um, we hope to see you all in about a month time. Thank you all.